long suffering, but he's long suffering for the sake of repentance, not long suffering so that the wicked go unjudged. And so don't misunderstand the long suffering character of God. God judges all sin, and he doesn't forget a single one. And even those who are saved have had their sin judged in the person of Jesus Christ. No one gets away with anything ever. Now Ezekiel is told that he is to take a, a, a sharp a knife, or, and specifically a barber's razor, and he's to shave his head and his beard. Now, this would be even more difficult than getting Paco to shave his head and his beard. And uh, I, I'll tell you something, it, this, this is a big deal because this is more than just a, I'm waiting for Sammy to come home and cut my hair. This is more of a cultural thing where it's a shame for a man to not have a beard. And so he says, shave your head, well, okay, but shave your beard, and this is something that uh, is going to get people's attention in the culture, and in, in just in all the culture, even for the unbelievers, but particularly for the Jews, this would get a lot of attention from those individuals as he does this. So Ezekiel's told, shave your head, and then he's told to take the hair that comes from his head and his beard, and you say, well, that would be kind of unequal lengths. Well, probably not. He probably had a very long, full beard. And so his beard hair would probably be longer and thicker than the hair on his head. That's my surmising. I didn't read that anywhere and don't have anything to substantiate it. But you weren't supposed to trim the corners of your beard. And so it, that was something a sissy did or someone that was strange did was to trim their beard. So it would have been a very long, a very full beard. And would have much, looked much like Josh the Calvinist who cruises up and down the street on his bicycle, if you know who I'm talking about. Well, anyway, uh, so he's got a long, full beard, and he's shaved it, and it's for an illustration. Then he's to take all that hair from his beard and from his head, and he is to take it, and he's supposed to weigh it, and uh, he's supposed to take balances to do so. Now, what are balances a picture of at all times in the Scripture? Judgment. Judgment or... What about, what about our system in America? What are balances a picture of? Justice. Justice, Justice, fairness, evenness. And so he is told to take his hair and to divide it into three portions. And this is a very strong illustration to God's people, the nation of Israel. So down in verse 5, this is what God says it means. First of all, he's supposed to take a part of it. He's supposed to take one-third and throw it in a fire. Then he takes the second part, and he is supposed to um, he's supposed to take the knife and chop it up and just decimate it. And so it would just be uh, just cut up into small fragments. And then he's supposed to take the third part and just scatter it in the wind. So here are people, evidently Ezekiel's doing this publicly. At least he's doing the uh, beard or the hair, these three parts with it publicly and as he scatters it in the wind that is a all these things are an illustration or a picture of judgment and so we see in verse 5 then the illustration not just the illustration but what the illustration means with regard to God's judgment thus saith the Lord God this is Jerusalem well what's Jerusalem the hair okay so again we talked about last week the tile is not Jerusalem it represents Jerusalem. And so uh, they, Ezekiel would have said to the people, this is Jerusalem. And it's the hair that he's about to go through this illustration in. I thought about shaving my head tonight, but I didn't have a beard to shave, so it wouldn't have worked very well. And Paco only got here at 5 o'clock, so I just didn't have enough time to convince him to let me shave his head and beard. But if you can imagine shaving Paco's head and uh, his facial... By the way, his hair from the, his last haircut is still... Uh, scattered around Chris's house. You can see traces of Paco every now and again when you go over there. So I can kind of picture it in my mind, although maybe you can't. It looks sort of like a rat's nest or something like that. Well, so you take Paco's hair and you take his beard and you shave it. Of course, he's got a real good beard. And you take the third parts and, and right in front of everybody, you say, this is Jerusalem. And you have the hair. And he takes the balances and you weigh them. And use it to separate it out into three equal parts. And so you would have on a balance only the ability to have two parts. So we divide it up into three parts, put two on, weigh it, remove one. When those two weigh equal, put it on there and, and go back and forth 
with the, the other two until all three parts equal the same. And so they're evenly distributed. And then you, he's supposed to take one group of hair and throw it in the fire. Now the neat thing about throwing it in the fire is that it does not just leave a visual illustration, but it also uh, leaves a memory with the people, if you will, that burning smell of hair, which is similar to the smell of burning flesh, I am told although I don't have first-hand experience on uh, burning human flesh. But uh, certainly when a body is burned, one of the things you'd smell would be the hair smell. My wife can't stand it. She hates when I take a torch and, you know, clean my arms up and that sort of thing. Uh, just doesn't like the smell of it. Well, so there would be a very strong picture with these people as he throws in the fire. There would be that And, of course, as the protein burns off, the smell of it and the picture of it. And it's really kind of... If you're thinking about it as this is Jerusalem and it's thrown in the fire, it's really a grotesque picture. It's very real. Uh, then, uh, so the, the, the Bible says it's Jerusalem. I've said it in the midst of the nations and countries that are round about her. And here's what she's done. She hath changed my judgments into wickedness more than the nations and my statutes more than the countries that are round about her. For they have refused my judgments and my statutes. They have not walked in them. And here is the accusation. Israel is in the center of all these nations. By the way, the Middle East is just the center of the world, really. Everything that goes on in the world seems to center around the Middle East. And, you know, a lot of people wonder, well, who cares about those little countries that are nothing? But, they're, boy, they're always in the news, and they're always fighting, and they're always the basis of wars, and... Always the basis of all these things. And Israel's just a little speck right in the middle of it. And here are God's chosen people whom God loves and whom God has uh, given these covenant promises to. And they're right in the middle of the world. And it is said about them from God in heaven that the way that they are, their wickedness, their God's judgments. And it's a picture with these balances of his justice. And God's justice has been changed into wickedness more so than the other nations. Do you remember how Israel came into the promised land? She came into the promised land because the wickedness spewed them out. And here we find that Israel is compared to those individuals that are without God and they are said to be more wicked. And this is a strong picture. And then the Bible says in his statutes, so God rules his laws more than the countries that are round about her. And so he's changed God's statutes into wickedness because the Bible says, for they have refused my judgments and my statutes, they have not walked in them. And the condemnation here about this illustration is that judgment is prophesied against God's people because of wickedness. Do you know that many times God's people have a bad attitude toward God about judgment? And many times God's people would even say, that just seems so harsh, or that's so terrible. And you don't need to be preaching about judgment. You need to preach about the positive things, not the negative things. Friend, can I remind you that judgment is positive? Read Psalm 119 sometime and see what, the, what David said about the judgments of the Lord. They're right, they're pure, they're righteous altogether. Uh, God's judgment is a wonderful thing, and yet uh, the, it seems so negative. And you know what's negative? Wickedness is negative. And I'll tell you something, more Christians, even than the lost, are guilty of saying, let's don't talk about the negative all the time. And, uh, you know, it's judgment's not good. And making it seem as though a God who is a righteous judge, that's not an aspect of God that's popular that we ought to talk about. And I want to remind you something, Christian. It is not judgment that is evil. It is evil that's evil. And judgment comes as a result of wickedness, not wickedness as a result of judgment. And if you don't like judgment, then how about trying righteousness instead of wickedness? And that'll avoid judgment. That'll make judgment wonderful. It'll make it just and it'll make it fair. And as Ezekiel is told to throw this hair into the fire, this picture represents a third part of God's people, the nation of Israel, who will be destroyed absolutely because of judgment. And as a second part are chopped up 
you see that this is a picture or an illustration of the nations being used by God to destroy Israel because of wickedness and because they turn judgment and they turn his statutes into wickedness. And friend, consequences do 